Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Novak. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on today's program, I have an update on the war in Ukraine. Ana Mateo brings us words and their stories on the expression firing on all cylinders. Dan Friedel has a story on this year's graduation speakers for the Higher Education Report. Mario Ritter Jr. and Faith Perlo report on heat waves in South Asia. And Brian Lynn has a story about political advertising on Facebook. But first, no matter where Ukrainians live, the three-month-old war never seems to be far away. Those in towns and villages near the front lines hide in basements from constant shelling. They are struggling to survive with no electricity or gas and often no running water. But even in areas out of the range of big guns, frequent air raid alarms sound. They are a reminder that a Russian missile can strike at any time, even for people living in cities like Kiev, Odessa, and Lviv. City residents are trying to return to regular life, but with every step they stumble upon either a crater or a ruined house or a grave, said Andriy Pustovoy. He spoke by phone to the Associated Press from the northern city of Cherniev. Cherniev was in the way of Russian forces as they moved toward Kiev early in the war. It was heavily attacked. Mayor Vladislav Atroshenko said about half of its buildings were damaged or destroyed. At least 700 residents were killed, and part of a city park now holds a cemetery, where some of them are buried. Its streets are mostly empty now. Half of the shops have not reopened, and public transportation is not working at times, said Postovoy. Few people are seen on the streets of Kramatorsk as well. The eastern city has been hit several times. The worst attack came on April 8th, when a missile struck near its train station, where about 4,000 people had gathered to be evacuated. A total of 57 people were killed, and over 100 wounded. Kramatorsk is one of the largest cities in the industrial Donbass that Russian forces have not taken over. The Donbass has seen battles between Russian-backed separatists and Ukrainian government forces, since 2014. Elsewhere in the Donbass, the situation is even worse. Ryisa Rybalko fled the village of Novomikhailovka. She lived there first in a basement and then in a bomb shelter at a school. We haven't been able to see the sun for three months. We are almost blind because we were in darkness for three months, she said. After Russian forces failed to capture Kyiv in the opening weeks of the war, they withdrew to the east. Residents have started to re-enter the capital. The nightly curfew has been reduced by an hour, and public transportation started running longer. They face long lines at gas stations, and the economy is greatly weakened. But the National Opera started performances again last week in Kyiv and some restaurants, cafes, and shops in cities like Odessa and Zaporizhia have reopened. Lviv, a city in western Ukraine, has received more than 300,000 people fleeing other conflict areas. About 1,000 arrive at its train station daily. Hotels, campgrounds, universities, and schools ran out of space for them long ago. The city has built temporary housing that looks like shipping containers in city parks. In cities and towns of southern Ukraine, the war continues regularly. In the village of Velika Kostromka, the remaining residents try to go on with life despite the occasional attacks. 
At least 20 houses were damaged on a recent morning, including three that were destroyed. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. This program explores words and phrases in the English language. And today we talk about an expression that comes from the world of vehicles and the engines that power them. In an internal combustion engine, a cylinder is said to be firing when the fuel inside it is ignited or lit. With that small contained explosion, the engine starts, and the car is ready to go. Most engines have four cylinders. Some very powerful vehicles have six or even eight cylinders. That brings us to today's expression, to fire on all cylinders. When you are firing on all cylinders, you are working or functioning at the greatest possible level of efficiency, speed, or productivity. In other words, you are at your peak performance. You cannot do much better. Sometimes we use this expression to mean we are using all our energy to do something. We are working as well as possible. For example, some people can only fire on all cylinders after they have had a good night's sleep. We often use this expression in the negative form. For example, every morning I have two cups of very strong black coffee. The coffee helps my brain come to life. So if someone tries to talk to me in the morning before I've had my coffee, I might say to them, can this wait? I am not firing on all cylinders yet. However, I would probably not say that to a supervisor. The expression is very informal. Now let's hear it used by two co-workers. Hey, can you hand me that notebook? It has all my notes for today's meeting. Hey, I'm sorry. Are you talking to me? You seem like you need more sleep. You do realize this meeting is about our project and will decide your future for the next month. I know. It's just really early. I don't fire on all cylinders until at least 10 a.m. Well, you had better get your cylinders fired up because here comes the client. Before you take on your next big project, make sure you are firing on all cylinders. And that's all the time we have for this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Thousands of college students around the United States finally came together in person to celebrate the completion of their studies without face coverings, virus tests, or pandemic restrictions. Some graduates from the past two years also joined the class of 2022 to receive their degrees in the traditional graduation ceremony known as commencement. They listened to speeches from other students, university leaders, and in many cases, well-known people from the world of music, politics, medicine, and sports. At the New York University ceremony on May 18th, they listened to a speaker who had left high school after 10th grade and never attended college, Taylor Swift. Swift began her music career at 15, and is now one of the most popular singers in the world. At NYU, she finally received her degree, an honorary doctor of fine arts. I'm 90% sure the main reason I'm here is because I have a song called 22, she told the graduates gathered in the famous Yankee Stadium. 
I in no way feel qualified to tell you what to do. You've worked and struggled and sacrificed and studied and dreamed your way here today. Swift added that she is not the kind of doctor you would want in case of a medical emergency unless you needed a person who can name over 50 breeds of cats in one minute. Antonio Vasquez completed his studies at NYU in 2020, but did not have a traditional graduation ceremony. The university had a special ceremony for the students from 2020 and 2021. Walking among the thousands of people wearing purple, the school color, he said he had a question in mind. Well, how do you give a commencement speech two years after you've graduated? Sort of just like, hope you have a job by now, right? But um, they did a really good job. The ceremony itself was well done and, um, you know, really provided some closure for, for me. At Princeton University in New Jersey, graduates listened to a real doctor during the school's graduation week event on May 23rd, known as Class Day. Dr. Anthony Fauci, the well-known infectious diseases expert, told the students to fight against the normalization of untruths and unfair access to health care. He said that many who died after getting sick from COVID-19 did not have access to medical care, good housing, or healthy food. He said many parts of a difficult life in the U.S. are related to undeniable racism that continues in our society. Class President Santiago Giron was a student speaker. Giron said there are two empty seats in the crowd right now. They would have been for his grandparents in Colombia, who died after getting sick from COVID-19. He said the sense of friendship and community he felt with his classmates helped him through the hardest year of my life. At a university in Florida, Rollins College, the student speaker made news, but did not say a word. Elizabeth Bonker was the top student in her class. Bonker, however, has autism, which prevents her from speaking. She has not used her voice since she was 15 months old. She used computer software that turns typed words into speech to talk to her classmates. She said the technology permitted her to complete school and free her mind from a silent cage. In her speech, she advised her classmates to work to help other people throughout their lives. We are called to serve, she said, and to see the worth in every person we serve. In Atlanta, Georgia, movie maker and actor Tyler Perry spoke to graduates at Emory University. Perry told students that even though they are done with school, they should continue to look for professors in other parts of their lives. They should seek the advice of experts and not run away from the feeling of pressure that comes when working to accomplish their dreams. For some, it takes a while to build a dream, Perry said. Stacey Abrams, who is campaigning for governor of Georgia, spoke at Spelman College. A 1995 graduate of the college, she told students to be bold when thinking about what they want to do in the future. She said, she learned to believe that I am capable of whatever I can imagine during her time at the school. Other speakers in May included New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, who spoke at Harvard, and U.S. President Joe Biden, who planned to speak at the University of Delaware on May 28th. Delaware is Biden's home state. 
In addition, sports stars, including soccer's Abby Wambach, tennis great Billie Jean King, Bernie Williams from the New York Yankees, NBA player Dwayne Wade, and Olympic runner Allison Felix visited universities to speak to students. I'm Dan Friedel. International scientists report that the disastrous severe heat wave in India and Pakistan recently was made more likely by climate change. They also say that such weather is likely to become more common. World Weather Attribution is a group of weather scientists from Britain, France, India, the Netherlands, Switzerland, the United States, and the Red Cross. It released its report May 23rd. The report says heat waves that affect a large area of Earth are rare, happening once every 100 years. But it said climate change now makes big heat waves 30 times more likely. The scientists said if the atmosphere's average temperature increases to 2 degrees Celsius, more than pre-industrial levels, big heat waves could happen twice every hundred years. Or more, says Arpita Mandal, a climate researcher at the Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai. She suggests heat waves as often as every five years are possible. This is a sign of things to come, the scientist said. The results are conservative in comparison to others. Last week, Britain's meteorological office said the heat wave was probably made 100 times more likely by climate change. Friedrich Otto of the Imperial College of London also worked on the World Weather Attribution Report. The real result is probably somewhere between ours and the UK Met Office result for how much climate change increased this event, the climate scientist said. The heat wave has been very damaging. Indian cities and Pakistan reported temperatures above 45 degrees Celsius in the past weeks. Pakistan reported temperatures over 50 degrees Celsius in some places like Jacobabad and Dadu. Parts of India's capital, New Delhi, reported temperatures of 49 degrees this month. India recorded the hottest March in the country since 1901, when such record-keeping began. April was the warmest on record in Pakistan and parts of India. The effects have been widespread. A glacier burst in Pakistan, causing floods. The heat also damaged wheat crops in India. The problem forced the government to stop exports to nations facing food shortages linked to Russia's war in Ukraine. The heat wave also resulted in earlier-than-usual demand for electricity. The coal supply shrank leading to power shortages affecting millions of people. The effects on human health were also damaging. At least 90 people have died in the two countries. Scientists suggest the number is higher because deaths are not always officially recorded. The Associated Press studied information from Columbia University's Climate School. 
It found that South Asia is the most affected by heat stress. India is home to more than one third of the world's population that lives where temperatures are increasing. Children and old people are most at risk from heat stress. Heat is also harder on the poor who do not have cooling systems like air conditioners. Many poor people live in crowded, dirty neighborhoods in large cities. Some Indian cities have tried to find answers. The western city of Ahmedabad was the first in South Asia to design a heat wave plan for its population of over 8.4 million in 2013. The plan includes an early warning system that tells health workers and residents to prepare for heat waves. It permits administrations to keep parks open so that people can keep out of the sun. And it provides information to schools so they can change class hours. Dr. Dilip Mavalankar heads the Indian Institute of Public Health in the western Indian city of Gandhinagar. He helped design the 2013 plan. He said the city has also been experimenting with materials that may help cool the tops of houses. The aim is to build roofs that do not hold the sun's heat. Some people use white paint or low-cost materials like dried grass to protect their homes from the heat. Most Indian cities are less prepared. India's federal government is now working with 130 cities in 23 states to develop similar plans. Earlier this month, the federal government also asked states to train health workers in treating heat-related illnesses. It also asked that ice, chemical treatments, and cooling devices be available in hospitals. Facebook's parent, Meta, says it will start providing more details about how advertisers target people with political advertisements. The company's recent announcement follows years of criticism that social media companies are not open about how campaigns, politicians, and special interest organizations target specific groups. Critics have expressed concern that the groups have been targeted with ad messages that are misleading or seek to politically divide citizens. Meta said it will start releasing details in July about the demographics and interests of people targeted with ads running on its Facebook and Instagram networks. The company said it will also share how much advertisers spent in an effort to target people in different U.S. states. Meta's vice president of business integrity, Jeff King, announced the change in an online statement. The decision will permit data about advertising targeting to be examined and publicized, he said. Such ads could be related to social issues, elections, and politics. We hope to help people better understand the practices used to reach potential voters on our technologies, King added. The announcement said Meta will provide researchers with new details about the interest groups advertisers chose to target.
The new details could provide information about how politicians might choose to spread misleading or controversial political messages among different groups. Some interest groups and Democratic politicians have long argued that misleading political ads have heavily targeted Spanish-speaking populations. The information will be available in Meta's ad library. The library is a public record that already shows how much companies, politicians, and campaigns spend on each ad run on Meta's social media services. Currently, anyone can see how much ad money has been spent. The library also shows the ages, gender, and states or countries an ad is shown in. The new detailed information will be available across 242 countries when a social issue, political, or election ad is run, Meta said. The company earned $86 billion during 2020, the last major U.S. election year. Experts say Meta's profits are closely linked to its highly detailed ad targeting system. They say Facebook's ad system is so customizable that it is possible for advertisers to target a single user out of billions of people using the service. I'm Brian Lynn. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Dan Novak.